I am Sean Webb, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Zach Poitra, and this is Your Superior Self. I'm Steve Sims, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Sue Jackson, and this is Your Superior Self. I'm Ginny Sarasvati, and this is Your Superior Self. What's up, everybody? I'm Aubrey Marcus, and this is Your Superior Self. What is up, Superior Nation? Welcome back to another episode of Your Superior Self. I'm Trey Downs, and I apologize about the quality right now of the mic. I'm actually at one of my favorite locations in the world, Fimic Island, Delaware, the place where I come to recenter myself, to to come back in touch with a higher consciousness, uh, the feeling of being one with everything. I mean, the water, the wind, the, the earth, the... The geese over here, the fish jumping out of the wall, and really love everything about this place. The ocean is a place that really makes me feel connected to everything. And sometimes you just have to go back to the place where you feel you feel one with everything to kind of rejuvenate and and get your creativity juices flowing. And that this is the place for me. And I highly suggest that you guys take the time. I mean, coming out of a two month quarantine. And everything that's going on in this world right now, like I think, if anything, we need to get back to that place that that recenters us, that gets our mind straight, and that we can kind of disconnect from everything that's going on, all that noise, and you know, a place that helps us become more of our true selves. Um, and today's guest, Steve Sims, I mean, he fires me up every time I listen to this interview. It's like one of those interviews that you go back and listen to and listen to and listen to and you always pick out some some really good content that just resonates with you. Each time you hear it, it's something different. This is that interview and I love our conversation. He has some crazy stories. I mean, he he has I mean, he just has this will, this drive and, and this this process of I'm not taking no for an answer and if someone says no, I'm going to I'm going to have a workaround to kind of get my plan, my my idea in place and so that it that it creates this this memorable moment and i mean here's an example of that right now so i had i was working in uh, i was working in rome um and i got a call from a client and he wanted to go down to a very powerful man and he wanted to go down to florence and show off to his future mother and father-in-law um that uh, he was you know a connected powerful man can you pull off a really fantastic uh, um, dinner for the night? And I was like, yeah, all right, leave it to me. Now, I could have opened up the Italian version of Open Table and got him uh, you know, a brilliant restaurant and got the chef to come out and shake his hands, but I wanted to see how far I could take it. So I ended up closing down the Academia Museum in Florence. Now, most people who have never heard of that, that museum but this museum is the place that houses Michelangelo's David, mm-hmm. the most famous, uh, the famous statue in the planet. Mm-hmm. And I actually closed down the entire museum. I had it from three o'clock in the afternoon till two o'clock in the morning. Oh, shit. I, yep. And I set up a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Can you imagine having dinner at the feet of an historic piece of art like that with someone that you care about and then to have somebody pull that off for you. Well, that's what Steve does. He's the CEO of a concierge service called Bluefish and he makes people's dreams literally come true. And the best part about this interview is that he gets my entrepreneur mind going because all of the ideas and the tactics and the strategies that he says anybody can use these i mean you could use a lot of the a lot of the advice that he suggests in this interview to get in touch with people that you never thought you can get in touch with and then some of the um methods that he uses you know to be authentic and to send them an authentic message or letter or video or anything like that to kind of get you noticed i mean i've never thought about these methods before and i think they're great and i mean I'm, I'm excited to use them, actually. Um, I'm actually uh, 
creating some content, some video messages right now to send out to some um, some some guests that I would love to have on the show. But I would have never thought about that if it wasn't for Steve. So I really hope that this interview helps you think about your business, your industry, your whatever you got going on. It kind of gives you ideas about how you can approach a new way of contacting people and being more authentic and trying to eliminate some of that noise um, and communication. You know, the email, right? The email is it's becoming more the archaic way of, of communicating because it's just, you know, it's easy to do. And a lot of people utilize that form of communication. But try to be different. And that's why I love this interview because Steve really fires me up and gives me new ideas on how to reach out to people and how to get them on the show. So thank you, Steve, so much for taking the time to hang out with me, brother. Mu- it's much appreciated. And I can't wait to try out some of these new strategies that you suggest in the show. So without further ado, guys, yeah. <laughs> without further ado, here is my interview with Steve Sims. I'm Steve Sims, and this is your superior self. Steve, thank you so much for joining, man. I, I'm excited about this conversation, dude. That's a pleasure to be here. So what do you got going on? What's going on in your world besides the coronavirus? Well, actually, that's it. Um, funny enough, five days ago, I was confirming all of the uh, gigs that I was speaking at and consulting flights. And the funny thing is, um, and I don't know when this goes out, but you know, I'm, I'm here in March. Um, I have not had two weeks at home since October of last year. Uh, mm. It's been stupid. And of course, let's be honest, you take advantage when it's going well for you. Um, all of a sudden, I now have six weeks at home and I'm, I'm thrilled. I've got so much free time now. But uh, all of the events and the consulting gigs I was, I was supposed to be having have all been moved into kind of like next quarter and the speaking gigs even some as late as... Uh, December they they rescheduled it for so it's been a little bit of an upheaval Mm. so why don't you go ahead and fill us in like your business what you do what your expertise is in wow um my expertise is in communication and what I give you give you the, uh, the 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 two cents elevator uh history of me I'm a 15 year old dropout from school um worked for my dad's construction firm launched the world's leading concierge firm that got people married in the Vatican by the Pope, sent people down to see the uh, wreck of the Titanic, put them on stage with our favorite rock star. Basically, I launched a -A Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, for people with really large checkbooks. Um, Mm. I then launched a book about three years, uh, two and a half years ago. Didn't think anyone would bloody read it, um, but I got asked to write a book, so I did that. And suddenly I am traveling around the world, consulting, speaking, and I run online courses and membership. And I really teach people how to get out of the way of themselves, start making shit happen, learn how to dream again, and really learn how to communicate, which I think is a dying skill. Mm. Well, how do you do that? How do you build that type of company, right? Like you said, your background's, you know, construction. How do you go from construction to concierge? Do you know, a lot of people think it was, um, and in the middle, um, I tried getting loads of jobs to, to better myself, should we say, and get out of the, uh, the rough world of Brick Lane, where in London just meant you got, you got pissed on every day. It was just raining and cold, and you just got smashed up. I wanted a better life for myself. Um, uh, failed trying to do that and ended up working on the nightclub door in Hong Kong. Um, and the funny thing was, I just wanted to surround myself with rich people. That was how primitive it was. When you look around at your five friends, if all your five friends are broke, then guess what you normally are? So I thought if I can hang around with five rich people, and just like, you know, podcasters now, great, and I have a podcast as well. The beautiful excuse of a podcast is we get to talk to loads of different people. (laughs) We get loads of different people's perspectives, viewpoints, uh, intelligence, you know, we get all of that. So I wanted to surround myself with rich people. So the whole reason of me setting up a concierge firm was to give rich people a reason to talk to me. And the whole goal was for me to be able to go back to them and go, Hey, how come you're so rich? The other thing is that never, ever happened without me realizing it. I grew a bloody company, ended up working with Ferrari, Tiffany, Piaget, uh, Formula One, the Grammys, 
to New York Fashion Week and some of the biggest events in the world. Just finished this year, finishing with um, Sir Elton John. Um, so it just, it was only an excuse for me to talk to rich, creative, affluent people. Who was the first uh, rich person that you worked with and how did you get to work with them? <laughs> so it was, uh, I was, I was actually working uh, in a club. I'd set up a party in Hong Kong and then I'd set up another party in Monaco because there's no point in setting up. A, if you want to get the richest people in the world, don't set the party up in Idaho. I don't mean, I don't wish any disrespect to Idaho, but go to Monaco, you know, go to Stard, go to, you know, New York, go to places like this. So I threw a party in uh, Monaco and there was a guy in there that was just up at the bar and I was chatting with him. There were two guys. Um, and we just ended up getting drunk and telling dirty stories and just having a giggle. And then the, um, I got to know these guys over a period of like about six months. Turned out one of them was one of the uh, last uh, surviving members of the Asprey family, which were jewelers to the Queen of England. And the other one owned this uh, company called Gulfstream Jets and then ended up buying IMG. So without me realizing it, I was actually hanging out with two of the richest people in the planet. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. But I mean, so you meet them, you hang out, you tell dirty stories. I mean, you seem like a very likable guy. Like I can, I could probably have a beer with you and hang out and bullshit. How do you maintain that, that relationship though? Like, so where you're at the point where you can do things with them for your business. I think, I think the reason that you could have a beer with me is because, and I hate the word authentic, I'm incredibly transparent. Mm. You're not going to kind of like sit at the edge of the bar and start reciting Nietzsche to me. You know, we're going to be telling dirty stories and chugging whiskeys. Um, I'm very easy to maintain a relationship with. And I hate precociousness. I hate precociousness and I hate bullying. Mm. And a lot of people, when they start to build up their business, and let's be blunt, some of the worst people in the planet are middle management because they're just getting out of the, uh, that kind of, um, uh, you know, in their ideas, hard graft. They're now getting behind the desk. They're now focusing on what letters they can get at the end of the car. So as long as it's the GT or the GTI or the GT Express, you know, they're looking for all of these labels. I'm working with people that own things like countries and, you know, Fortune 500 businesses. They still shit in the can. They still have problems. Things don't always go right. And I'm the kind of guy that just sits and goes, well, you know, what are you bitching about today? You know, what's your problem? And I'm just very easy to communicate with. And again, it goes back to that communication. I was just very transparent. So I would just say to people, what do you need done? You know, can I go and do it for you? And then my wife, my wife always said that I had the super superhero um, uh, ability uh, sorry, superhero power of ignorance. She said, I would never be frightened of anything. I would just go and knock on a door and go, hello, can I come in? I've got 20 people that want to be in there. And I would just ask, and you'll be surprised if you actually go up and do that. Sometimes they'll just be so stunned. They'll be like, uh, okay. And you just walk in and everyone around you is going, how did you do that? And the more times that you do it, the more kind of immune to a no. So mm. in the end, people will say, no, you can't. And you still walk in. And it's just, it was just that kind of thing. I ended up making some, uh, some very good relationships, some pulling off some, uh, some pretty big monumental things to the point where I would be able to turn around and go, hey, I know this is going to cr uh, sound crazy, but I was with the Pope and Elon Musk last week, but I'd really like to do this with you. And now you're starting to get people caught up in, in, in that euphoria of like, well, that kind of connects me to those people. And before you knew it, you know, it was just a ladder process. The bigger and wilder the things got, the bigger and the grandier things you could pull off. Man, that's crazy. Like, is there still things that you want to pull off? Like, are there things, people that you want to meet right now that are just, that you feel like you still have to get to? Uh, no, um, but there probably will be. It's a case of, I don't think, uh, again, growing up as a bricklayer, 
I never had any of these aspirations. And again, you know, I'm 50 years old now, so I never had Instagram to show me how richer your life was than mine. So I never had any of these aspirations. The only rich guy I knew, you know, on TV was Richard Branson coming from England. That was like the superhero of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And now I've worked for him and his mum. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of weird. I still get into rooms. I still do things. I'm talking to you at six o'clock in the evening. You're there. I'm here. I still find it amazing that anyone wants to bloody talk to me. So yeah. what am I going to do next week? I don't know, but I know it's going to be exciting. Why do I know it's going to be exciting? Because screw the coronavirus. I'm going to make it exciting because I don't want to continue to be in the same spot. I don't want to become stagnant. I don't want to become stationary. I'm always trying new things. Where that's going to end me up? What room is it going to put me in? I have no idea, but I'm just always open for it. That's awesome. Like what, what, tell me like a great story right now. Oh, I know it's probably hard because you have so many of them, but like some, a great story that just blew your mind that you, you took a step back and you're like, I cannot believe this shit's going on right now. Bingo. Got it for you. So I had, I was working in, uh, I was working in Rome um, and I got a call from a client and he wanted to go down to a very powerful man and he wanted to go down to Florence and show off to his future mother and father-in-law um, that uh, he was, you know, a connected, powerful man. Can you pull off a really fantastic uh, um, dinner for the night? And I was like, yeah, all right, leave it to me. Now, I could have opened up the Italian version of Open Table and got him you know, a brilliant restaurant and got the chef to come out and shake his hands, but I wanted to see how far I could take it. So I ended up closing down the Academia Museum in Florence. Now, most people have never heard of that, that museum, but this museum is the place that houses Michelangelo's David, mm -hmm. the most famous, uh, the famous statue in the planet. Mm -hmm. And I actually closed down the entire museum. I had it from three o'clock in the afternoon till two o'clock in the morning. Oh, shit. Yep. And I set up a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David. And I had the clients delivered to the front door of the museum, had the two massive gates of the museum open up, had them walk down a rose petal red carpet to that table. And I had a string quartet um, playing while they ate. While they got to their main course, I then walked in Andrea Bocelli to serenade and while they were eating their pasta. Oh, now, man. that was unbelievable. That was, that was incredible. It was one of these situations, and I explained it to you before, because I've been managed to do so many amazing things, so many other amazing doors open up. I always go for the, I always go for the moonshot. I always reach for the moon, and if you fail you grab the stars. In this situation, I thought to myself, what's the most ridiculous location in Florence you could get that no matter where you are in the planet, you have to be in Florence. Someone could recognize it as that could only be in Florence. Mm -hmm. If I put you in one of the cathedrals, you could have been in Paris, you could have been in Amsterdam, you could have been in Poland, you could have been anywhere. You know, a beautiful cathedral looks like a beautiful cathedral. Mm -hmm. But if you're in Paris, and in the background is the Eiffel Tower, you know you're in Paris, okay? If you're in New York and they've got a Statue of Liberty in the back, you know you're in So I thought, I wonder if I can get something with David. So I went for it, and they agreed. And then I thought to myself, wow, I've got that. What could I possibly do to top this? Well, if you're going to be in Italy, who's the most famous Italian singer on the planet? Andrea Bocelli. So I contacted Andrea Bocelli and I thought, I'm not going to get him. I'm not going to get him. And he went, okay. I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. You know, so you say about what was the most ridiculous thing. I'm actually sat. So just to give you the visual. Sure. There is a concave behind Mon Michelangelo's David and a plinth built into the, uh, into the wall so that you can sit there at different angles to see Michelangelo's David. Mm -hmm. we're sat at the right corner of it. Now, Andrea Bocelli is blind. I have the perfect profile view of Michelangelo's David. Mm -hmm. Next to me is Andrea. Next to him is his beautiful wife, Veronica. And Andrea starts warbling to get his throat muscles going so he doesn't get a cramp. 
and starts warbling. And I sit there and I'm thinking to myself, hang on a minute, I'm a bricklayer from East London. I've closed down an entire museum in front of the most famous statue in the world, next to the most uh, famous Italian sp uh, singer since Pavarotti. And all of a sudden, my body froze. Literally, it froze. I, you know when people say, oh, someone walks on your grave because you suddenly get this cold shiver go yeah. through you? Yeah. I got it. And it just went like this. And Andrea's blind, blind, but he obviously felt me shudder. And he spoke to Veronica, and Veronica said to me, she said, are you okay? And I said, I just realized where I am, what I've pulled off, and who I'm sat next to. And I just got literally goosebumps. <laughs> and so, That's crazy. I, exactly. But I think one of, the, one of the things that keeps me, I suppose, grounded is I don't take it for granted. I'm walking down the white carpet with Sir Elton John at his Oscar party, and everyone's trying to get near him. And I'm wandering down the bloody carpet with him. You know, so I still get these kind of like little kitty. I think it's the Irish kid in me. I'm kind of like, <laughs> oh, I can't believe I got away with this. You know, I do expect one day someone to knock on the door and say, hey, you know, stop it. You're having too much fun. You know, I'm just, I'm just expecting that one day. That's all. Like, do you have these, you know, these high ranking people on speed dial like do you, do you have relations with them outside of uh these parties and gatherings and things of that nature you have to because yeah. if you call them like i get a ton of people call me every year around the grammys every year around the oscars they're like hey steve we haven't spoken for a while and i say to them that's because it was this time last year you called me for a freebie and i'm guessing that's exactly what you're doing now so if you call people only when you want something, then you're going to get a no. Mm. So you have to nurture those relationships. If you want to do something with someone and by any chance they throw an annual party on New Year's Eve in Miami and you want to get into that party at New Year's Eve in Miami, then call them at Easter. Call them in June. Get together with them for coffee in August. Nurture their relationship. So that as you get close, you get invited rather than you having a collider. Like mm. So that's, that's the first mistake. People always call people when they want something. Here's the, here's the daft thing. Here's a, here's a perfect example. I call you tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you see the phone ring and you see it say Steve Sims. Okay. Actually, it doesn't even have to be me. It could be any of your buddies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before you answer that phone, you can be guaranteed of one thing. I want something. Okay. You don't know what it is, but it could be, I want to chat. I want to go and have a beer with you. I want to talk to you about your podcasting. I want you to talk about, you know, a mate. Whatever, but the, when someone calls somebody else, you're guaranteed that the person calling is going to ask you for something because that's why they call. Mm -hmm. So if you make it low liability and low friction, can like, hey, how you doing, man? I just wanted to chat. You know, I was just thinking about you, or you know, hey, I wanted to talk to you about your podcast. You know, what's what what mics are you using now? You know, if you just engage in a conversation, then it gets the person off level, but. If you had a party every single year and you got a call from me four weeks before that party, and I know you're smirking now, you can kind of guess what it is what I want. So you've got to keep those relationships. You know, I would work with Sir Elton John throughout the year, and I finished off working with him this year for the eighth year. Mm. But I wouldn't only communicate two weeks before the bloody party because that's when every other freeloader does. Yeah, but how do you build that trust though? I think my biggest issue, right, is one, like, do I call a person? Like, do, is that okay? Like, I feel like people are so used to email. And then once I start, you know, building a rapport with someone, like, how do I maintain it? Is it, you know, is it through email? Is it through phone calls? Um, I do. I do two things. Email is the coldest, worst way to communicate in the planet, I believe. It's one step worse than Twitter. Um, it's just a crap way of communicating with someone. There are two really good ways of doing it. One, phone someone, but two, and this is the one I really love, video and then send them a text. 
Okay. Video. Like, what do you mean video? Like a video phone? text. You pick up your yeah. cell phone and you go, hey, man, you know, I wanted to chat with you about the upcoming podcast and um, I wanted to find out who your audience was. You know, give me a shout back and let me know. And then text it to someone. Why? Because the one reason text is better than an email is the junk file. Mm. Text doesn't have one. Every mm. text I send gets received and gets opened. And if it gets opened and there's a little video of me, you know, kind of like in that little screenshot bit, you're going to be, what does this guy want? And then you push play. And here's the beautiful thing. There's a thing called tonality. If I put in an email, tomorrow night, beer, 7 p.m., don't be late. If you've had a bad day at work, you're going to find that demanding. You're going to find that very ordering and bossy. Okay, because understand an email is received in the mood the person is when opening up the email. Mm -hmm. Remember that it's very deep. But if I send you a video text, go tomorrow, 7 p.m., beer, don't be late. You've got that enthusiasm, you've got that motivation. Doesn't matter what mood you're in, you're now receiving it in the mood that I was when I sent it to you. Yeah. It's harder Perfect. to confuse what I'm trying to get. So that's the, so that so there's two things: one, phone call and video text. But thirdly, here's the most important thing that should be number one: enter every new relationship with value. Mm. Now, when I communicated with Sue and John, I was communicating because they had a fundraiser that I felt I could raise money for. I felt that I could get more powerful people in that room. I felt that I could get more donations into the charity. And I came forward going, hey, I want to be part of this because of this, 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 this. I can help with this. When I was involved with the New York Fashion Week, I can help you get more uh, promotion. I can get, help you get more buyers in there. The New York Fashion Week was full of a bunch of socialite pricks that weren't buying anything. I was able to turn around and get people in there that were actually interested in paying, not freeloading, paying for the outfits, buying the designer stuff, talking about it and getting it out into the media. And so I was able to bring money over, not just pretty skinny people that had never eaten. I love that. <laughs> you are authentic. I love having a conversation with you, man. <laughs> well, just uh, be transparent. Anytime you can open up a door, and it's been the same it's been the same with anyone that I've ever wanted to get hold of that's powerful. And I've been at Andrea Bocelli. When I phoned up Andrea Bocelli, I was able to say, hey, I've been working with a friend. Because I knew that him and Elton John knew each other. I've been working with a friend of yours. But before I get into that, I know that you're actually involved in an Italian cancer foundation. I have a very powerful client coming in. If you can help me, I am sure I can make a sizable donation to the Cancer Foundation, would that be of interest? Mm. So I had established credibility and now a benefit, not for him, because understand, how much money do you give Andre Bocelli or, or Elton John? You think about how much money Elton John is making while sitting on the toilet. Mm. So do you want to really piss him off by phoning him up and going, hey, Elton, how much would it cost for me to have you sing at my birthday party? He's going to tell you to go fuck yourself. Yeah. But if you can turn around and go, hey, I know this foundation is very near and dear to you. I can help that get more followers, more committed people, more donors. Would that be of interest? I'm now playing into something that they're passionate about. Mm. How do you get around the gatekeepers though? You know, like the assistants. Well, yeah, and there's many ways of doing it. And I have to admit, it's been a long time since I've had to worry about it because now I'm at that level where I get, you know, the power players to introduce me directly to the power players. Mm -hmm. But in the early stages, the best way to do it is actually calmly to find up and go, hey, uh, is Trevor there? And just, again, make out as though you, you'll be as nonchalant as though they think, oh, they must be friends. Sure. Uh, another way of doing it is to actually send a, um, a personally signed, uh, a person handwritten letter um, and send that in because the gatekeepers will always think that's a personal letter because the letters you get in the post nowadays are always typed because they're always a bill and the secretary is always open there. But if you run down to a local hotel of yours, make sure it's a five-star hotel, get an envelope, put a letter in it, 
put a handwritten address on the front, put a stamp on it and post it to the person. They think it's a friend that's traveling overseas or something that's sending a letter to them and it gets through. And you can put in there, um, I wanted to have a chat with you. This is my cell phone number and my email address. I'd like to talk to you about so-and-so. If you give me a ring or if you send me an email, we can arrange a time for us to talk. And that will get you through. But getting your foot in the door is one thing. Bringing value, that's what makes you stay in the room. Now, bear in mind, you could, you could send a tweet, a message, an Instagram video today to Elon Musk. Mm. Now, here's the daft thing. You know you can do that. You know you can do it. But 99% of the people that have just heard me say that won't. But I do. I literally will do a little video and I'll send it to Elon Musk. I'll send it to Mark Cuban. I'll send it to Richard Branson. And some of them respond. Not all of them, but some of them respond. And that's where the communication starts. Get their attention, then bring value to the table. And that's when you get invited to the party. That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, we have Twitter now, right? Like you have Instagram, you have methods of messaging yeah. these people. You can find their emails, if not their assistants. And you absolutely can. You absolutely. Yeah. I've got a friend of mine, Dan Fleischman. Um, he's probably one of the most connected people you've never heard of. Um, Dan Fleischman runs all the social accounts from everyone from Dan Bazarian, Mark Wahlberg, the Kardashians. Mm -hmm. He's an incredibly connected man. And he runs, a, um, he's, he's invested in a ton of businesses. And people come up to him and go, oh, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about investing in my business. Dan Fleischman says yes to every single proposal. And then says, send it to me. You can easily find me. Mm -hmm. He says, and even though he's on Instagram, even though he's on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, all of these public profiles, he said, you can guarantee less than 5% actually follow through by sending the proposal. Really? Even though he said yes. That's crazy. Like, uh, that's crazy. Following through, like, who would know? Like, you have, I mean, people I mean, don't do it. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Like, I think for me, I mean, I step back. Like, I am probably with the podcast, you know, I've had my fair rejections, right? Because, you know, who knows? Nobody knows trade downs. However, the mission is very special to me and I'm very passionate about it. And, you know, you got people, you know, that you that you work with, I'm sure get hundreds and hundreds of emails from different people about scams and, you know, trying to make them famous, blah, blah, blah. It's hard to weave out like the authentic guys as opposed to just, you know, the, the guys that are just trying to get a, a, a selfie and put it on Instagram and become Instagram famous. Um, but the biggest challenge for me is just, having showing that credibility right like saying i have this podcast i have this x amount of listeners you know this is my mission and it's hard because it's like everybody and their brother has a podcast now right like it's like you're, you're trying to show them that you're different you're trying to show them that you're more passionate than the rest of them you're trying to show them that you you have a better show than them it's like it's just hard though i i you know i talked to uh I, like i just became um cool with aubrey marcus right and that took forever oh! Yeah, yeah. I love Aubrey. See, I, I'm sure you guys go far back, but it's like, you know, me, <laughs> you know, I got a, in order for me to get in that room, like I had to, I had to get introduced to him to Seth Godin, right? Like I, right. I met Seth Godin and I had to bring that value. And it was like, you know what? I, I, I seriously and genuinely don't want anything other than having a fantastic conversation with you. Here is Seth Godin. Here's his email address. This is my gift to you. I, 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 the gift that you're going to give me is for you two to have a conversation that's going to be phenomenal. I get to listen to that. I get <laughs> that to be, be good. I, you know what I mean? And, and they're doing that. Like they're going to release a, um, a, an episode and it's because I, I introduced them. And then Aubrey came on my show and we had a phenomenal conversation. And now it's like, you know, it's things are starting to add up, but it's like, it's, it's tough. It's hard. You have to keep pushing through. You have to keep working. And I'm sure you experienced that at the beginning of your business as well. I still, I still get it now, but you see, you've just done it. You just, you just entered into a relationship by bringing along value. You mm -hmm. just validated everything I said. And here's the thing. <laughs> there's a million podcasts out there. And there's a couple of things that everyone should know about podcasts. One is that for every, every day, 
there may be a million podcasts that get started. And by the end of the day, there's a million podcasts that no longer have any juice. All right. The other beautiful thing, and this is what's the beauty I discovered about podcasts and why I'm on so many podcasts is that you may have a pretty good podcast today. Okay. You may be exceptional. You may be the Joe Rogan this time next year. Okay. If someone subscribes to your podcast next August, they're going to get this episode downloaded onto their phone. Okay. It's evergreen material. Yeah. So, you know, never say no to it because you may not know. I've done so many podcasts where the podcast has gone, yeah, it's a new podcast. And, you know, they've recorded John and gone, screwed out. I can't bloody keep up with this anymore. And it'll never see the light of day. Sure. And I've done other podcasts like Jordan Harbinger when he was with Art of Charm. You know, yeah. I still get people contact me about Art of Charm and he doesn't even do it anymore. So <laughs> it's amazing. And Joe Polish and Dean Jackson, always these kind of things. So I think podcasts are a really good medium. Mm -hmm. But it's a roulette game. You know, you're, you're running it as you are now. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that I would change for you, Trey, and to, if I could give you a little bit of advice. Sure. Um, and it's basically to change your perspective. Don't try to be better than anybody else. Try to be more of you. Because it's the transparency of who you are mm -hmm. that people will relate to, that they will connect to. And the more real you can be as the Trey, no one can ever copycat that. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. I'm still trying to figure that out, man. Like for, you know, that's one of my development goals is to really figure out who I am. It's like, you know, for years, I thought I was, you know, my dad, I thought I was my grandfather, you know, third generation railroader. And it was like, I had to live up to their success. And it was I did things because they were, you know, proud of me. So like, I'm figuring who I am you know, every day and, and trying to be authentic and, and be uh, the best version of myself. And it's like every episode, like I'm up to a hundred and whatever it is now, like each episode, a little bit of me comes out. And it's like, 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 I love this conversation right now because it's like, this is who I am. This is who I am. And I'm, um, I'm getting closer to the most authentic version of myself. Did you, um, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but did you ever read my book? No, I have not. All right, okay. I did a book uh, about two and a half years ago that really brought me into you know the, the profile. Before that, I think half a percent of the planet knew who I was, but but that half a percent owned things like countries, so mm -hmm. I was I was doing fine. The book came out and it kind of like took me in another direction. When I was about sixteen years old, I was on the building site with my family. I told you before that I was an East London bricklayer. Left school at fifteen, straight onto the building site. There was one day that I was climbing up a ladder. It was in a pissing rain in London. And I had what they call a hod, which is like this weird uh, thing that sits on your shoulder where the bricks sit in it. And I'd loaded a ton of bricks up into the scaffolding. And I got to the top of the scaffolding and I had all my family working on this building site. And this one day, they were all working on what was called the same line, the same wall. They were all bricklayers. They won this line. As I got to the top of the ladder, and I've got a whole load of bricks on my shoulder, my dad was at the top of the ladder. He was closest to me. Next to him was my uncle. Next to him was my two cousins. Next to him was my granddad, who was now in his 80s. Mm. I saw my family tree and my future down that line. And wow. I, it, I stopped. And my dad yelled at me, put the bricks down, we need more bricks. And I, I did that. But this was so impactful, I can still smell the air from that moment. Wow. And then when I went downstairs, it was tea break time. And at 10 o'clock, we all sat in this old shitty caravan and kind of warmed up before we went back out in the rain again. I sat down opposite my granddad. He's trying to warm up. He's got a cup of tea. He's got his woolly hat on. You know, he's freezing his, his bits off. And he's 80 <laughs> years old on a building site. Big old Irish lad. And I said to my granddad, because stupid kid i said to granddad i said granddad did you ever think you would be doing this at your age now in fairness if someone had said that to me i may have smacked him in the mouth because it was a very direct rude question he didn't even look at me but he stopped sipping his tea for a second and he said son if you don't quit today you'll be me tomorrow oh 
I went up to my dad as we all came out of the caravan. I said, dad, I got to quit. And he said, why? And I went, granddad, you know, I just spoke. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I, there's got to be more to me than this. Now my dad understood. He didn't argue with me. He said, see the week out, son, I'm sure. And did. And I went, I will, I will. He never gave me any shit. My mum. God, she was like, oh, you think you're better than us? Oh, you're turning your back on the family. I was like, mom, I think I'm better than this for me. You know, I want to see if I can do better. Me and my mom never really had a good relationship from that day. My dad understood. My granddad understood. But from that day, I tried to get into something else. But it was that moment that I realized I had to try. I had to see if I could be better. And like all entrepreneurs, we try things and we fail. We try more things, we fail more. We're serial failures, but we don't allow it to define us. We allow those mistakes to refine us. And I'm always scared for the people that try something and fail and then just go, whoa, that's it. Because as we all know, the fight's not over when you go down. It's mm. when you stop getting up. Mm. That's, that's pretty powerful. I mean, even for your grandfather at 80 years old to say that, right? Like back then, like to say that, to have the, the consciousness to tell his grandson that. Yeah, I and think, it, well, it, let's be serious. It was the generation, you know, mm -hmm. I'm in my fifties now. I remember, I remember getting a cane at school. You know, they don't have those now, do they? You know, you can't oh, even, you can't you even to, shout. You go to jail for that. My God, you can't even shout at a child now. You'd be fined and lose your job. Um, <laughs> But I remember getting the cane in the headmaster's office one day. And this was from, I was an East London boy, bearing in mind. And he was caning me. And I remember him screaming at me going, Sims, you're nothing but a hustler. Mm. Now, let's be honest. If you walked into a job now and on your resume, it said natural born hustler, you're going to get a job straight away because people want that. But in that generation of the 80s, it meant that you couldn't get a real job and you were probably some kind of, you know, wannabe gangster selling ripped off car stereos or something. So yeah. it's funny how the generations have changed. It's crazy how the universe lines up, right? Like, so when you, after you left the construction business, like, did you have an idea what you wanted to do? No, no, no. My mom thought I was going to jail because mm -hmm. I literally would go, I'd get a job in the morning at 11 o'clock. Uh, well, this doesn't challenge me. I'm quitting. And so my mom was like, can't you keep a job? And I was like, I got to find something for me. Entrepreneurs, we, we're diseased. We've got to, we, we don't fit in a hole. We have to find a hole that we can sculpt, we can design. And then once we're in there, damn, we're the conqueror, you know? Mm -hmm. So we have to find what challenges us and invigorates us. And that's why most entrepreneurs run their own business. Um, it's the entrepreneurs that end up working for them. Um, but I think I just had to try and find something. So I was, I was a big British biker, young lad, cocky, arrogant, East End boy, thought I could fight the planet. So I was just destined to get into trouble. Thankfully, I started to find things, including my wife, that started to kind of like channel my energy. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's, I was lucky to get it, but my mum saw me bouncing off of so many jobs, um, getting into so much trouble. I was frustrated as a youngster. So it was, it was a, it was a tough period growing up. So when you became successful as an entrepreneur, did you ever mend that relationship with your mom? I went back, um, and this is so obnoxious now. Um, I ended up working for Ferrari. And when I would travel, they would say, when you land, you know, go here and pick up a Ferrari because we want you to be driving a Ferrari when you're in that area. Mm -hmm. um, I owned motorcycles, but I would turn up in a Ferrari because that was the contract I had. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went down to see my dad um, and uh, I told him, and I hadn't seen him for like years. And I was like, dad, I was a doorman and I started throwing parties. And then the people in the parties were really rich and I would end up throwing their parties. And they ended up owning things like, you know, these corporate gigs and I would throw their events and I've worked for the Grammys and this. And, and here's a Ferrari, I'm working with Formula One. And my dad was very proud. When my dad went to the garage to get the beer out, because we kept the beer in the garage because it 
kept it cold because mm-hmm. it was England. And mm-hmm. England's always cold. My mum actually whispered in my ear, are you selling drugs? She had listened to this entire story and she could only fathom it, would only relate to it, would only acknowledge it if I was gaining that money illegally. That's wow. the only way she could comprehend it. So I hate to say it, but no, my dad passed away. My mum's still around. And sadly, I haven't spoken to my mum for years. Really? Why is that? Yeah. We don't connect. Sadly, right. we just can't. We, we can't communicate. I'm living up here now in Mal- uh, near Malibu. Um, very happy, very comfortable, um, doing some great things around the planet, flying literally around the planet continually. This coronavirus has kicked out like about eight cities that I was supposed to be visiting in the next two months, mm-hmm. um, purely simply because of the uh, um, flight restrictions out of the sure. US now. Sure. Um, but my mum's never had a passport, never left England literally does not understand. And I've tried making amends. Um, I've made sure they looked after financially, but you know, actually I remember stubborn. Is that what she's just so stubborn or you're stubborn? She's very stubborn. She's very stubborn. I remember going and seeing my dad and, uh, saying, look, you know, and he said, look, we got a few problems. And I was like, you, you, you never got problems, never financially. You know, you just tell me what, what's necessary. And, um, I helped him out. And my dad said to me, um, I had to tell mum." that I won the scratch it game on the way home because if I'd have told her that we'd got this money from you, she'd have thought it had come from some kind of dodgy means and wouldn't have touched it. Really? Yeah. So this, this That's was a, this crazy. is a stubborn, Hey, look, you know, an East London Irish lady, there are some people you pick on, but not that breed. Um, so, <laughs> you know, she's a, she'll fight you until there's no blood left in her little toe. So sometimes you just got to realize that, you know, you can't pick your family, can you? No, you can't. You just you got you just gotta love them for who they are. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. that's all you yeah. can do, really. Um, yep. You don't pick your family. You just love them, and it is what it is at that point. Um, yep. But I mean, your story is just—it's just—it's fun. You know what I mean? Like it's fun. Like you got to party. I'm sure you had some amazing parties. You had to meet, and and but it's a lot of work, though, right? Like people think they hear oh parties, right? You're just having hanging out, drinking some beers, whiskey, whatever. But you gotta, you gotta network. You gotta connect with people. That takes a lot of effort that people don't realize. Well, I've never enjoyed my parties um, <laughs> because um, the host, you know, if anyone thinks about their own parties, their own parties at home. If you're the host, you gotta make sure the food's there. You gotta make sure the drinks flowing. Mm-hmm. You never, and then you gotta clean it up. The host never gets to enjoy the party like an attendee. So any of my parties have been work. You know, I've stayed off the drink. I'm focused on, and people are like, oh, let your head. I can't. This is work. This is business. This is what I'm doing. You party, you having a good time is my business. But then I'll get invited to their parties and bang, I'll knock the top off a whiskey and I'll enjoy myself all night because I'm not the one cleaning up in the morning. But um, yeah, I've had some great times, but it, it 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 is hard work making things look seamless and easy mm. it really is um and that became a that became quite a talent and a and an education on how to do that so you're saying you're traveling well you're not traveling now because of the virus but you were yeah. going to travel uh, what what are you working on currently for the business so um i'm doing a lot of consulting a lot of speaking um i have a lot of good friends and we have, a, we have an online platform called Sims Distillery that I'm actually getting them on where we do live interaction with all of our members. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm focusing on a lot more of that. Uh, I, just, I just came out of prison a couple of weeks ago. Um, came out of prison? Yep, yep. And I, I, know, I know my mum would be like, no, that's not surprising. But <laughs> for the last three years, I take about 40 entrepreneurs into a maximum security prison just outside of Los Angeles. Mm. And we teach the uh, inmates that we call EITs, entrepreneurs in training. We teach them how to take that hustle into productive businesses for when they get released. Mm. So it's really, it's really impactful. Uh, It's really life changing. And if you're ever concerned how wealthy you are, spend the day in a level four maximum prison and then come out 
Wow. You know, the air's bluer, the grass is greener, the air's fresher, you know, just you feel so alive. And so once a quarter, I take a bunch of entrepreneurs to prison and um, we do a shark tank experience mm -hmm. where we teach them how to take that hustle out into you you're trying to teach a guy how to do a, su a successful business and he's been running a, a, a drug ring that's been making 10 million dollars and is now in jail yeah. and you're just going okay so you know how to hire people you know how to market and i said mm -hmm. to him because this was last week i said to this guy i said look when the, when the market started going down what did you do and he said well my best clients I'd give him a deal. Maybe I'd send him a couple of girls. Or so. I said, so you know about marketing and lo loyalty rewards programs. I said, you know about these things. You were just doing them in a different environment. So it's, it's fun to actually be able to do those kind of things and to just enjoy life and to get people to just dream bigger and imagine possibilities. I'm always stunned at why people dream small. That's the time when you should be able to float. You should be able to, you should be thinner in your dreams. I know I'm better looking in my dreams. Why should anyone cap the realm of possibility in your imagination? Yeah. And your imagination, they, they don't do that in real life. Um, they're scared. They're they're They don't want to be disappointed. And that's fine. But in your dream, you should be a superhero. Sure. You know, and you should, if you could find somewhere between that superhero and reality and just go, I'm just going to try something a little bit different just by, I'm going to do a video text. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to try and do this crazy thing called follow through because, Hey, I listened to Stephen Trey and when, when they told us that no one follows through. So the next time I get the possibility of getting my foot in the door, maybe I should try and follow it through. You'll be amazed at what can be achieved. That's awesome. I love the the phrase that you use, like you shoot for the moon. Every time. And if you miss, you at least hit a star. I, and that's the thing. People say to me, oh, have you ever failed? And I can hand on heart say no. And that is ridiculous. That sounds like an outright lie. But when you understand, it's because I've never given a client what they asked for. Mm. I've always tried to exceed. Now, have I always got what I reached for? Very rarely. Very, the the uh, Florence example was one of the flukes where mm -hmm. everything just fell into place. But 9.9 .9 times out of 10, no. But again, when you step down from that, hey, what's my impossible reach? Yeah. And you get just one degree, you're still a million miles off of what the original request was. Yeah. So let's give it an example here. Like say you're just starting out. Let's say you're, uh, I don't know. Let's say you're me and you're trying to get Joe Rogan. Okay. How would, how would you do that? How would you go about trying to get him on your show or give him value? Like, give me an example. Okay. Well, okay. So good. You, you actually answered it in, in that question. What's the value? What does Joe want? What is going to be Joe's compelling reason to talk to you? That's, that's the thing you've got to think of. First of all, what is Joe working on that you have some kind of unique quality that could help him with? This could be, you could be an artist and you could design his, his website. You know, this could be you're an SEO technician and you could make sure he gets more people coming to his website. It could be you're an author and a copywriter and you could write his memoirs without him getting out of bed. Give him a reason to see value in you and then you get the ask. When you can go forward and say, hey, Joe, I know you're supporting this charity. I know that you travel a lot. Uh, I know that you do X, Y, Z. Here's a solution. I've gone to people with solutions and they've shut me down. Mm. And I've still got the deal. Mm. Why? Because I came to them with a solution. What's the worst thing you ever get in a job? We were talking about your job earlier. People come up to you and they go, oh, there's a problem in aisle five. And then they look to you for the solution, don't they? Yeah. The real people you love are the people that come to you and go, hey, there's a problem in aisle five. Hey, shall I just get this, this, and this done? And that'll clear it up. Now, even if that solution sucks, even if what they're trying to solve doesn't make sense, at least they've attempted to solve the problem that they brought to you. 
So when I've gone to people, I've gone, I had this guy and I said to him, hey, I, I, I heard you're writing a book. I've got this guy that can actually write the book. He's very good as a copywriter. He actually interviews you over this time and he can actually transcribe this into a book. You don't have to do anything. And he turned around to me and he went, I decided not to write a book. And I went, oh, okay then. He said, but you came to me with a solution, not a problem. Why are you here? <laughs> and then I told him what I wanted and I got the deal out of him. So you'll be surprised what it does to someone's mindset when you're actually there for their benefit. If you want Joe Rogan on your show, and Aubrey knows Joe, yeah. okay? So there's, there's a link for a start, okay? Yeah. You gave Aubrey a reason to talk to you, and it was Seth, okay? Does Joe want to talk to Seth and maybe can't get hold of him? Now, I believe anybody can get hold of anybody, but the trick is to not have to stress I would be over the moon if you phoned up and said, hey, Steve, do you want Seth? I'll be like, yeah, I haven't got to make the effort. But I know 50 people, including Aubrey now, that has met Seth and has got his details. And by me texting Aubrey, I could probably have Seth's details in an hour. Sure. But if I've got to do no effort on it, hey, I'm happy about that. Yeah, yeah. So what's the value that you can bring to Joe or anyone out there thinking, whoever you want to connect with, what is the value you bring to the table that makes you irresistible? Mm -hmm. But I feel like a lot of, like I do this especially because it's like, I'm not trying to be salesy. I'm not trying to, you know, overplay the hand. I'm not trying to be that guy. I know I have something that I want, but it's like, I also want to make sure they get that value. And it's like, when do I do that? You know, like, I don't want to be seem fake by, you know, building this relationship and then asking. And it's kind of like you when you first right, so I can stop you there uh, I can stop you there for start stop thinking yeah. all right you're over most people don't do things because they start thinking that's usually what stops any creativity because you're talk yourself out of bloody doing it mm -hmm. all right do you remember right at the beginning you said oh I can see why people like you because I can just have a beer with you because I was transparent sure I would come up to you and I go, hey, Trey, I want this from you. But before we get into this, I hear that you want to get Joe Rogan on your show. I can get you, Joe. When would you like him, Monday or Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Now, I said to you that I needed something. This is what I need. The big C in life is cancer. Mm -hmm. The big C in business is confusion. Mm -hmm. The higher the profile you are, whenever you get in front of someone, that head is worrying. That's sitting there going, what does this person want? Does Trey want a selfie? Does he want, does he want an autograph that he's going to sell on eBay? Does he want some spiritual advice? Does he want to sell me something? What does Trey want? And the trouble is, that spirals out of control. That's why most people at profile look offish. Because they don't know how to connect with people. Because they don't know what you want. But they know you want something. Sure. Again, it's like that phone call times a thousand. Yeah. If you can quiet that voice in that person's head quickly and go, hey, how you doing? My name's Trey. I'm a podcaster. You don't know who I am. But I noticed that you're working on a foundation and I've got a way of you being able to get more marketing to that foundation without you doing anything. Now you're telling them while you're there. You are completely transparent. And they're like, oh, and then you say, hey, but I'm going to want you to get on my podcast, but let us focus on the value for you. Sure. Let's talk about you. And people literally will get stunned. I've done that with so many people. That's how I've got there. I've literally gone up to a guy, hey, I'm Steve Sims. You don't know who I am. And I want to actually have my client in your movie. But before we talk about that, I know you're raising money for your kid's soccer field. Or I know you're trying to do this. Or I know I've heard that you're having a problem with this. I have a solution for you. Mm. Transparency quietens down that nagging little monkey in the back of their head. And now they know exactly why you're there. They know exactly what they're getting. And confusion no longer exists. Steve, I could talk to you all night, brother. Um, how can people connect with you? How can, they, can, how can they find you? So I'm pretty easy to get. I'm on uh, Steve D. Sims pretty much everywhere in the planet. Um, I've got stevedsims.com. If you want to actually talk with me and can I get involved with me, I do these uh, AMAs, Ask Me Anything, twice a month, actually. Uh, first Tuesday, last Thursday, 
on simsdistillery.com. So I'm pretty easy to get hold of. And again, I'm on Instagram showing off my Insta perfect world like everyone else. <laughs> What's your podcast called? The Art of Making Things Happen with Steve Sims. I love it. I'm going to subscribe to that. Um, Steve, before we go, one last question. Um, when it's all said and done, brother, like, what do you want your legacy to be? Ah, oh, dear. Um, I want people to just say, uh, my legacy, what do I stand for? I suppose I just want someone to say, you know, he did what he said he was going to do. I, I, I remember being an East London boy and we all, we all uh, romanticized the mafia and the mob and all those kind of movies for this, that these are people of honor. These are people that keep their word. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to get it done. I just want to be that guy that, you know, when I'm sitting there in the dirt, someone says, well, he did what he said he was going to do. Mm. And that's, that's all I want. Steve, brother, man, thank you so much for joining the show. This has been fucking great content. This has been great value. I know my audience is going to benefit from this conversation. I just want to thank you for taking the time. It's been a pleasure, Troy. It's been, it's been cool to hang out with you.